See, that's uh, what I don't, I don't remember things. Uh-huh. Do you know what you did yesterday? No, I don't. How about this morning? I don't even remember that. What would you do if you could no longer make new memories? It sounds like such a foreign concept, doesn't it? But it's happened. In fact, it's occurred several times in human history, and as you may have guessed, none of the cases are good. Patients can be living a relatively normal life one minute, and the next minute they're unable to form new memories at all, or can't even remember an event that occurred mere seconds ago, obviously severely limiting their life. Cases have arisen from botched operations to even instances of contracting common viruses and brain infections. However, despite such insane consequences of someone developing amnesia, these patients have taught science so much. We owe a great deal to these amnesiacs and the knowledge they have given. So let's explore one of the most prolific cases of amnesia of all time. For this is the man who following his accident, he never formed a new memory again. Henry Millayerson was born February 26th, 1926, in Manchester, Connecticut. All was relatively simple in his childhood, at least what we know of. Up until the age of seven, it's believed he performed well in school and had lots of friends. But unfortunately, his world was soon to become very different. Henry was out in his neighbourhood playing one day, exploring and having fun in Hartford, being a genuine kid. Yet, out of nowhere, a bicycle rider rides straight into him presumably accidentally. Now, Henry quite forcefully bangs his head on the pavement and is rather dazed and stunned. At the time, it's unsure whether or not he went to the doctors following the head injury, but regardless, they would not have been able to see inside his skull for the damage anyway, with the technological limitations. So, Henry returned home at some point, but overall, he had become rather different to the horrors of his parents. He had his first seizure shortly after the accident. These were new, but they remained. He had minor or partial seizures for many years all the way up until he was 16 years old. It was actually following his 16th birthday that he had his first major or tonic-clonic seizures, almost incapacitating him. Still, he persisted with life, not letting the new, more sinister seizures affect him. He began taking anticonvulsant medication, the drugs normally prescribed to those with epilepsy, which alter electrical activity in neurons by changing the concentration of ions such as sodium, potassium and calcium, which in turn affects neurotransmitter transmission between synapses. This was now the norm for him, but the drugs were still not enough. With the dosage gradually increasing, it increased until he was 27, for he had begun work on an assembly line and was now on the highest safe dose of the medication, yet it still wasn't enough. Now Henry was having his biggest seizures and had to quit his job, for his seizures had become so overpowering he was practically unable to work, or even to live a normal, standard life. Following the now rampant seizures, Henry was referred to William Scoville, a neurosurgeon at Hartford Hospital. Dr. Scoville localised Henry's epilepsy to both the left and right medial temporal lobes of his brain, and suggested that all these areas need to be removed. Now, for a bit of context, the temporal lobe itself makes up just under 20% of the entire brain, with the medial lobe a hefty section of that. Scoville believed that Henry should lose all of this, including the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the entorhinal cortex, and on September the 1st, 1953, this is exactly what happened. Henry's surgery was performed by lobotomy. This sees the surgeon or doctor insert a metal tool or an ice pick under the eye or up the nose to then chip away at the brain matter that is to be altered or removed. It's an insanely barbaric procedure that is now only performed in a select few places around the world. And for more context, only around 10% of these surgeries worked. Scoville left around 2 centimeters of hippocampal tissue in the remnants of Henry's brain, but it was soon to undergo atrophy and become non-functional. The rest of his medial temporal lobe can be brutally extracted and destroyed, never to be used again. Now, fortunately for Henry, this did actually help him in curing his seizures. It was somewhat partially successful. It removed the incapacitating nature, but he did still have them. However, shortly after this surgery, 
it appeared that Henry had a deficit much greater than before. For Henry had developed one of the worst cases of amnesia the world had ever seen. His amnesia consisted of not only severe anterograde amnesia, which is the inability to create new memories following an accident, but also a degree of retrograde amnesia, which is a patient unable to recall events that occurred before the accident. Now, with such a case like this rarely coming around, scientists were soon quick to jump on it, eager to see what we can learn about human memory. This is what they found. Could you tell me what you had for lunch today? I don't know, to tell you the truth. I'm not... What do you think you'll do tomorrow? Whatever's beneficial. Good answer. Have we ever met before, you and I? Yes, I think we have. Where? Well, in high school. In high school? Yes. Have we ever met any place besides high school? For they had met mere days ago. At the time, many scientists were firm believers that memory was widely distributed throughout the entire brain, for it was not dependent on any one specific region or organ. As Henry did not show any memory impairment before the surgery, the removal of both medial temporal lobes effectively proved to scientists that this was responsible for his memory disorder. Plus, the fact that Henry could no longer form episodic or semantic memories again tells us that these brain areas were crucial in their production. These types of memories refer to one's subjective life experiences, and then facts, ideas and concepts, respectively. To this day, this has continuously been proven with other, whilst not as severe cases, brought into light. Interestingly, Henry did keep his overall intelligence. When he was asked to store words in his head temporarily, he was not actually impaired. In fact, he performed relatively similar to controls, never forgetting the words when they were in his short-term memory. This only differed for sentence language level comprehension and production when Henry did actually show the same deficits and sparing as in memory. These findings from Smith and Coslin in 2007 helped us realise that our long-term memories are what is dependent on these medial temporal structures, whilst our short-term working memory isn't related to area at all. Thanks to this case, scientists have been able to localise this to our prefrontal cortex. Another thing Henry's case taught us was about memory consolidation. Specifically, the neural structures responsible for consolidation were not again what we originally thought. With Henry's retrograde amnesia, he could not remember events that occurred before the accident, to a degree. His older childhood memories remained, but around a year before is what had vanished. This revealed to scientists that older childhood memories no longer relied on the medial temporal lobe but the more recent long-term memories did. Thanks to Henry, we learn that these older memories enter and are stored in the neocortex. I want to ask you some questions about World War II. When was World War II? Well, it began before the 30, 1939, where we entered it. And we entered it on the 7th of December. In what year? 1940. Mm-hmm. These older memories were safe in the neocortex. With the findings from this, Henry's motor skills were also tested to uncover knowledge about procedural memory. This is also a type of long-term memory, but instead of the retrieval of semantic or episodic memories like Henry's anterograde and retrograde amnesia, it's the retrieval of information necessary to perform learned skills like playing the piano and riding a bike. It was a psychologist, Brendan Milner, who spent a rather long time working with Henry and asked him to draw a figure by looking at its reflection in the mirror. It's quite a common procedural memory task, and like most people performing the task for the first time, Henry did very poorly and went out of the lines around 30 times. But with lots of practice and performing it several times a day, he began to make no mistakes at all by day three. Milner was therefore able to conclude that these motor skills are also not stored in the brain region Scoville removed, and were eventually localised to the basal ganglia and cerebellum, hence why Henry could perform so well. It's subconscious. This is why you can jump on your bike after so long of not riding it. Following these results, the scientific community was in awe, with Brenda Milner even saying, everyone is wanting an amnesiac to study. Henry was always experimented on, forever destined to be a pawn to science, but it did gradually slow beginning in the 1970s, 17 years following the surgery. 
Henry moved back in with his parents and then a relative. He couldn't work again, but he did help with shopping, mowing the lawn, and he relaxed in front of the television. He lived the remainder of his life still never being able to form new memories, dependent on those ones from the past. In 1980, Henry moved into a nursing home where he eventually died from respiratory failure. In 2008, his final few years saw him always eager to have visitors and researchers. He joked a lot and made good friends with the likes of Brenda Milner, but still unable to remember their conversations. Milner reportedly said that Henry's case was incredibly interesting to a colleague, and with Henry in earshot, he replied, he doesn't think he's that interesting, and left the room. Following his death, Henry's brain was removed in the post-mortem and sliced to preserve it forever. 3D reconstructions have been produced and images uploaded to the cloud. Henry's case has allowed us to learn so much about human memory, including how it works, the brain regions associated with it, and even what the barbaric removal of such crucial components can do. We owe Henry a lot, and thanks to him, his knowledge and his legacy can live on forever. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate every single one of you. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. It's free and it really helps me out. See you next time.